<laughs> well, um, my name is Jackie Street and I'm a partner at Silver Levine. We are chartered certified accountants and we're based in Warren Street. I head up the Bowster unit along with two other partners where we look after the accounts and tax affairs of over 2,000 Bowster clients. So I'm here today to talk to you about two main areas. Firstly, how to finance the path to achieving a career at the bar. And secondly, I'm going to be talking to you about your tax and filing obligations once you commence your pupillage at Chambers. I'll also, as you said, um, talk to you about one or two tips about how to save tax. So as I'm sure you're aware, a career at the bar it offers significant benefits. It has the potential to be exciting, it's well respected, it uh, can be lucrative and of course it's intellectually stimulating. But the road to becoming a barrister is notoriously tough and of course it's an expensive one. So what are you up against financially? Well firstly, there's your undergraduate degree. As I'm sure you're aware, universities now can charge up to £9,250 per year, plus there are your living costs to contend with. In addition to this, your law conversion course. So if you undertook a non-law degree, you will need to study a, grad a graduate diploma in law, or a GDL. And fees for this go up to 13,000 for a full-time course in London. And on top of this, there are your bar course fees. These range from 12,000 pounds to 19,300 with courses in London, of course, being more expensive. Then your, there are your living costs on top of this. Um, you should be aware that the different universities providing these bar courses, they vary not, in term, not only in terms of the fees, but also in the types of tuition on offer. So, for example, the contact time that you have with tutors, the materials that are provided, and the learning styles that they cater for. So do compare your course providers carefully before making a decision. You should also be aware that some of these law schools they will divide your bar course into do two different parts, with part two being more expensive than part one. So that if there is a student who unfortunately fails part one, they will not be tied into paying for the full course, which reduces their financial risk. So for example, the ICCA bar course costs around uh, 14860 with part one being just 2,700, part two being a lot more expensive, 12,160. Okay, so what sources of finance are available to you to help you with these financial liabilities? Well, the biggest source of finance will be scholarships and bursaries from the four inns of court. Uh, they offer uh, scholarships totaling £6 million per year, which is quite significant. And I'm going to talk to you in detail about this a bit later on. Other forms of finance. Savings. Um, you may have savings that you can use to help uh, pay towards your bar course. Uh, but in my experience, students tend to owe money rather than have significant savings. You may have support from your family to help pay towards your bar courses. Then there is the Student Loans Company. So the Student Loans Company provides postgraduate funding for master's courses. So if you choose a bar course which is combined with a master's qualification, you will be able to apply uh, for a student loan from the Student Loans Company. <laughs> Max funding, 11,836, which will go towards your, co your course and your living fees. You could apply to a high street bank for a postgraduate loan. Loans tend to range from £1,000 to £15,000, uh, but they are subject to a suitability assessment. Right. In addition, you will be paying interest at the commercial rate on the loan. So you'll be paying back not only the capital itself, but also the interest. There are private student loan providers as well. Uh, for example, Lendwise, uh, the size of the loans on offer vary considerably, but they are basically assessed on your future earnings potential. I would advise that you apply for these loans at least six months before commencing your bar course. Again, interest will be due on the loan. 
Then there are the law school providers themselves. Uh, they offer a limited number of rewards and bursaries, <laughs> but they are, they're directed at students who are exceptional, right? or to students who need the extra support because they cannot afford the course <laughs> at all. Okay. Next, there are pupillage award advances. So if you are fortunate enough to gain a place at Chambers whilst you are studying for your uh, law course, um, sorry, your bar course, some Chambers allow you to draw down on your pupillage awards. You can actually take money out of your award before you actually join your Chambers. Um, this will help fund your bar course fees. But what I should say is anything that you draw down prior to starting at Chambers, well, that will be deducted from the pupillage award that you would have received when you do jo join Chambers in your first year. Also, part of that drawdown may be taxable. Okay? It depends on the structure of your award, and I will discuss that a little later on in the talk. Other forms of funding, charities. So some charities may offer financial support, but these are quite rare. Um, I would suggest that you speak to your local education authority awards officer to discuss this further if you want more information. And finally, the Bar Council themselves. Every year they put on a, an, a law reform essay competition with prizes in excess of £10,000. And this is, opening to, this is open to anyone studying for a law degree, for GTL, your bar course, or even those currently seeking pupillage. So just be aware, all of this information that I'm talking to you about is all uh, on the public domain. So please do uh, look it up or do your own research afterwards to get more information. Okay, so going back to the main sources of funding, the four inns of court. Uh, you're probably aware there's Lincoln's Inn, Inner Temple, Middle Temple and Gray's Inn. As I've already said, Scholarship awards total in excess of six million pounds per year and are aimed at covering both your, your GDL, your bar course, and indeed your pupillage. Uh, the grant may also include subsidised housing arrangements. So how does the scholarship application work? Well, you can only apply to one in, just one in. So do your research about the inn, focused on the inn, that will give you the best chance of success. Okay? You don't have to be a member of an inn to apply for a, a scholarship, but you will have to be a member to receive the funding. So what are the inns looking for? Well, basically, they're all looking for the same things. Firstly, intellectual ability. They will be looking for evidence of excellence in your performance at university, They'll be looking for excellent legal research skills. They will be looking for motivation and a serious commitment to succeed at the bar. Um, they'll look at your potential as an advocate, your oral skills, such as meeting, debating, mock trials. Then they'll look at your personal qualities, your reliability, your independence of mind, your leadership skills, and of course, your integrity. And finally, they will look at your financial circumstances. Every scholarship will be means tested. Um, so I'm now going to look at the inns individually. We'll start with the first in Lincoln's Inn. They provide funding of about 1.8 million with about 1.5 million being directed at bar course scholars and 178k being directed at GDL scholars. They offer about 100 scholarships that vary from 6K to 25K. Um, but remember, there's no set amount because at the end of the day, the amount you get is means tested. Uh, the Inn also has a number of student flats available for bar course scholar studying in London. But note that the rent for the accommodation will be deducted directly from your scholarship award. So what is the application process? Well, you would first make a written application to the inn. Then if you are successful, you will be invited to an interview panel. Okay. No award is made without an interview first. Um, closing dates for the bar course, uh, around the beginning of November prior to the year which you commence your bar course. GDL closing dates uh, May, um, 
in the year commencing your GDL course. So it's essential that you make your application prior to the closing dates, as well as any references that you may need. So do take that into account, references. In a temple. In a temple is the inn with the largest awards budget. It has a, a, a budget of around 1.9 million pounds with 1.8 directed at bar course awards and 200,000 for GDL awards. Um, again, the scholarships vary in size, um, but approximately 100 awards are on offer with the largest being 22,000. Um, the other thing about in a temple is it is the only inn to guarantee a GDL scholarship winner and an award of at least equal value for a bar course scholar without further interview. Okay. The application is very similar to Lincoln's Inn. Next two inns, Middle Temple and Gray's Inn. Middle Temple has funding of 1.25 million with 1.1 being directed at bar course scholars and then Gray's Inn. So the thing to note about Gray's Inn is it has fewer awards, but they are much higher in value. So although they have a budget of 1.3, the bar course awards go up to 30K with an average of 17,000, and the GDL awards go up to 12K with an average of 7,300. There are also some residential scholarships on offer with about um, 19 places receiving free accommodation in the Inns Estates. Okay. Um, so before I move on to the second part of the talk, um, I just want you to think a little. So uh, the rewards uh, are great for those who succeed at the bar, okay? But the path to becoming a barrister is extremely expensive and high risk with no guarantee of becoming a barrister at the end of it. So before you do enroll on your bar course, do take a reality check, yeah? Think about your skills and your potential. Do you have what it takes to beat the odds and succeed at the bar? And I'm sure you all will, okay? Um, and I look forward to hearing that you've all uh, achieved a place at Chambers. Um, so my second part of the talk, I'm going to roll you forward. You've now won pupillage at Chambers. You have commenced your pupillage and you are enjoying your new exciting career as a barrister. So uh, what are you going to have to think about uh, to meet your tax and filing obligations? Okay. So HMRC will deem that you have commenced your self-employment barrister trade from the start of your second six at Chambers. You will need to formally register for self-employment with them by create, sending in a form. It's called a CWF1 form. So once you are self-employed, what does this mean? Well, it means firstly that you will need to file annual tax returns with HMRC. And secondly, it means that you will become liable to four different types of taxes. So enjoy. Okay. So what are these taxes? First one, class two NIC. It's a very simple tax. It's three pounds 15p per week. Uh, one year's worth will be paid all in one go with your annual tax return. Second and third taxes, income tax, which I'm sure you know and love, and NIC class four. These two taxes, they are di directly dependent on your self-employment uh, profits, okay? But they're calculated by different methods, and I will explain that in a bit more detail later on. But first, let's just talk about a tax return. What is a tax return? Um, well, it's a form that always covers a fiscal year. Fiscal year runs from 6th of April to 5th of April. It has to be filed by the very latest, 31st of January, following that fiscal year. And the taxes associated with that tax return must be paid by two famous dates, 31st of January following the fiscal year and the 31st of July following that January. So what goes into a tax return? Well, you would declare all forms of income, okay? Um, the most important form will be your self-employment income and expenses, which I will talk to you about in a moment, but other forms of income could be things like interest that you've received on your savings, could be returns on investment. You could have a rental property and receive rental income from that. 
um, you may be employed at the same time, some barristers are, and we would have to declare your employment income on your tax return as well. Other things that go in will be things like gift aid payments and pension payments that you may make because these two things will give you tax relief, that's money off your tax bill, if your top rate of income tax is 40% or higher. Okay. So the most important thing that's going to go into your tax returns, I would envision, will be your self-employment income and expenses from your barrister trade. So what does this comprise? Firstly, income. Let's talk about pupillage award. So any pupillage award that you receive in your first six is not taxable. We would not have to declare it. Any pupillage award you receive in your second six is taxable. When it comes to your drawdown, a part of this may be taxable. Okay. It depends on the splits of your award between the first and second six. For example, if you have a pupillage award of about 60k, you take a 10k drawdown, and of the remaining 50k, 60% is received in your first six, and 40% is received in your second six, then 40% of your drawdown will be taxable. Right, that's 4k, I believe. Okay. Um, the other thing to note about chambers and their pupillage awards is that some chambers wait their pupillage award more heavily in the first six. Okay, so you receive more of your award in the first six compared to the second six. Well, this will benefit you financially because you are taxed on a smaller percentage of that award. Okay. Other forms of income you receive apart from your pupillage award will be fees that you receive from your clients and, of course, deviling income if you uh, do any deviling work for other barristers. Expenses. So what expenses are you likely to incur? <clears throat> By definition, an expense is something that is wholly and exclusively for business purposes. Note, I didn't use the word necessarily. So if you've got your eye on a Mont Blanc pen or a Gucci Willy bag that you want to use to carry your bars around, it's absolutely fine. You can go ahead and purchase them as long as you are using them for business purposes we will be able to bring them in your accounts. Okay, I know, this is good. Okay, um, now what is not an allowable expense? Entertaining. So for example, you take a fellow solicitor out for a meal, you take a client out for a meal, this will be deemed to be entertaining and is not tax deductible. Um, so now let's go through what your expenses are likely to be. The biggest one is likely to be your chambers, rent and expenses. You may have a holiday from this initially when you commence pupillage, but it will certainly grow as your turnover grows. Um, subsistence costs. Subsistence, this is food and drinks what's outside your normal pattern of trade. It is not your normal breakfast, lunch, dinner. It is more if you are out and about visiting different courts, different clients, and you grab an extra snack or a coffee. It's that sort of thing. Obviously, if you stay somewhere overnight in a hotel for business purposes, then all your uh, food and drink at the hotel will be tax deductible. Other forms of expenses, motor costs. If you use your car for business purposes, we can account for your expenses in two different ways. So firstly, we can apply the simplified scheme, which is where we would include 45p per mile, for the first 10,000 miles, then 25 p per mile thereafter. Alternatively, we could bring in all your car expenses, absolutely everything, um, your car insurance, your road tax, your, your petrol, your uh, repairs, everything, bring them all in, but we would prorate them for business use. Other types of expenses, your, your phone cost, the cost of your mobile phone, the cost of the calls on the mobile phone, if you use your home internet for business purposes, we would bring that in. If you use your home landline for business purposes, we would bring that in, but we would prorate them again for businesses. Writing materials, pen, paper, note pads, that sort of thing. Your computer cost, the cost of the computer itself, the software, the insurance of the computer. If you buy a printer, 
uh, from your home to use for your business, the printer, the toner cartridges on the printer, um, research costs, any books that you buy, red book, white book, archbold, um, if you uh, purchase any online research facilities such as Westlaw, we would bring that in. Even if you buy the Times for the law pages, we can bring that in. I will not tell them that you do the puzzles in the back. That will just keep it for sure. Um, subscriptions. These are memberships to professional bodies. So, for example, your membership to the Bar Council, um, the Pratt Certificate, Data Protection, we can bring these in. Your indemnity, insurance costs, tax deductible, our fees, my favourite, tax deductible. Um, training and CPD costs, we will bring that in. Court attire. And court attire, HMRC are quite strict with these days. So at the moment, all you can have are collars, cuffs, wig, gown and bands. I would say you could also get away with the court shirts, you know, that don't have a proper collar, so you can put a separate collar on the top. We could bring those in. Um, there is it's very, very sad, I know one case, it's called Malia versus Drummond, uh, where HMRC won the case to disallow dark suits because of duality of purpose. They keep you covered, they keep you warm, and you cannot split the personal and business use elements of the suit. Um, and finally, your uh, bank charges and interest on your business bank accounts, we can bring that in. Um, another thing you should note is that you can actually go back seven years pre-commencement and you can bring into account any capital item you have purchased um, for your business. A capital item is something that lasts longer than a year, like your computer, your wig and gown, desk or chair. Okay, so um, I would start thinking about your receipts now actually, you know, if you are thinking about buying a computer to keep your seat, um, start from now. Okay, um, so what do we do with all that information? We take your income, we deduct your expenses, we come up with a profit figure. We then use that profit figure to compute those two taxes I mentioned, firstly income tax and then class or NI. So income tax, I'm sure you've already got an understanding, your first 12,570, it forms your personal allowance and is tax free. Then your earnings from 12,570 to 50,270 is taxed at 20%. Then earnings from 50,270 to 150K is taxed at 40%. Then earnings above 45, earnings above 150K taxed at 45%. Um, Note, due to the recent budget, that threshold of 150k, it's changing, it's coming down. It will come down to 125,140 from April 23. Okay. National uh, Class 4, NI, how does that work? The first £11,908, you don't pay any NI. Then earnings from 11908 to 50270 you, you will be taxed at 9% earnings in excess of 50,270, you will be taxed at 2%. Um, as if that's not enough, okay? There are your student loans to contend with, sorry. Okay, student loans are paid along with your taxes when you submit your annual tax returns. So how do student loans work? Well, if you have a plan one type loan, then your earnings above 20,190, 20,195 will be taxed at 9%. I use the word tax, it's not a tax. They will deduct 9% of your earnings above that threshold. If you have a plan to type loan, then your earnings in excess of 27,295 is taken at 9%. In addition, there are your postgraduate loans to repay. Again, that is taken at the same time. So your earnings in excess of 21K will be taken at 6%. Okay. I'm now gonna move on to the next tax, which is the lovely VAT. Okay. Uh, VAT has a completely separate regime of its own. It is not connected with your tax term. 
Um, how does it work? Well, it's a lovely setup. It's basically where businesses gather a tax for HMRC and as a thank you, you can reclaim the VAT that you spend on your business purchases. Okay. So how does it work? Well, what you're meant to do, once you commence trade, is you're meant to do a test uh, on the last day of every month. Then the test is you go back 12 months. I appreciate you won't be able to do this initially, but then you go back to your commencement date. So you go back 12 months, you look at your turnover. Has it exceeded 85,000? If the answer is yes, you must register for that within the next 30 days. So once you are registered for VAT, what does this mean? It means firstly, you must tell your clerk to start charging 20% VAT on your fees. This is very important. I have had some clients who have forgotten to do this, so it's can be quite expensive. Um, so tell your clerks to start charging 20% VAT on your fees. And secondly, you will need to submit quarterly VAT returns to HMRC. So what goes into a VAT return? you would declare the fees that you've received in a quarter, you would declare the VAT that you've gathered on those fees, then you can declare the business expenses that you paid for in the quarter and the VAT that you've paid on those expenses. Then you would net or deduct the VAT that you paid off the VAT that you've gathered from your clients and pay the difference over to HMRC. There are fines and penalties if you are late. You have one month and seven days post the end of the quarter to prepare and submit the VAT return and pay over the VAT. So quite an admin headache and even more so because of new MTD legislation that I will talk to you about in a minute. Um, but before I completely slate VAT, right, let's talk about the benefits of being VAT registered. Okay. And there are some benefits. So, um, firstly, um, you could, I've told you when you must register for VAT, yeah, when you exceed that threshold, but you can voluntarily register for VAT earlier, right? And indeed, your chambers may insist, okay, that you register when you join them or when you commence tenancies. You might not have a choice, but you can voluntarily register early. So, what are the good things about being VAT registered? Firstly, cash flow. You can reclaim the VAT that you spend on your expenses. And if your chambers are charging you VAT on the chambers rent and expenses, this could be considerable. Right. Also, in your very first VAT return, you can go back four years pre-registration and reclaim the VAT on any capital purchase you've made for your business. Again, capital purchase, something that lasts longer than a year, wig, gown, wig, <laughs> wig, gown, chain, uh, computer, desk, chair. Okay? Um, so there is a cash flow advantage to being VA2 registered. Second advantage, you look more established. If you are not VA2 registered and you are not charging VAT on your fees, your clients will know that your turnover is below 85k. So they will be able to size you up, which I think is a bit of a GDPR breach, it's a bit outrageous, but they can, they can. If you are charging VAT, they won't know what your turnover is. Okay. So you look more established. And uh, the third reason for registering sooner rather than later is that you will never make the mistake of going over that threshold and forgetting to, to register for that. So I have had some clients who've come to me a year down the line, they've just been so busy because pupils normally are worked very, very hard. So busy, didn't realize they went over a threshold a year back. And in these situations, well, you have to register at the right time. If it's a year back, it's a year back. And then any invoice raised post that date well, HMRC will deem that VAT was charged, even though it wasn't, and that VAT will be due to HMRC. So it can be quite an expensive mistake to make. Um, I'm just going to make one further point about uh, VAT, which is the delightful making tax digital legislation that is affecting us today. 
um, it's a, a relatively recent introduction. Um, it currently affects everyone who is VAT registered. And what it means is that today, Everyone who's VAT registered will have to store every business transaction digitally. That means held in some sort of software, date, amount, description, VAT element. And they will need to submit their VAT returns using MTD compliant software like Xero, Sage Cloud, QuickBooks. And this software, it costs money, sorry, um, compared to the lovely free simple uh, VAT software that HMRC used to provide. Okay, so things are slightly different today. Um, at Silver and Bean, we, we use zero cloud accounting software. We give our clients an app called Dext, which allows you to snapshot your invoices and then a picture of the invoice and also the numbers on the invoices feed through directly into your zero account. Um, it, it also has the ability to connect directly to your chamber system, which is no, normally Lex, okay, so that we can automatically have your income feed through into Xero. That is how we deal with the lovely MTD at Silver Levine. Um, so I'd now like to just touch on the golden rule, okay? Golden rule, really, really, most important thing you take away with you if you get everything, forget everything else. This is what you need to remember. And the golden rule is that when you are self-employed, it is absolutely crucial that you put money aside as you go along. Absolutely crucial. It is nothing like being employed. So I would advise that you set up a separate interest-bearing account for your tax and that you set aside early days, I'd say 30% of your turnover, including any award you receive in your second six and move it so you can do it on a weekly basis, monthly basis, whatever works for you, but move it into the tax account. Don't touch it until you know what your tax liability is. Okay. Um, I'd like to just finish up by telling you about our first year free offer that we give to new pupils uh, joining Chambers. The first year free offer would involve the preparation of your first set accounts and your first tax terms and you would have an annual meeting uh, with an accountant to discuss your tax affairs. It is conditional upon two uh, criteria. The first is that you provide your information to us in a timely manner and the second is that you are receptive to us continuing to act. Um, thank you very much for your time. Do you have any queries? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. How much money do you have to set aside? How much money? It's related to your turnover. So I would say initially, I would put aside about 30% of the money that you receive mm -hmm. yeah, on an ongoing basis, some sort of regular basis. So maybe do it. you can do it whenever you receive a payment. You could do it on a weekly basis, a monthly payment, but 30%. 30%. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Can you say oh, that? Sorry, I said, what sort of tools would you recommend to help uh, submit tax invoices? I know there are some banks that have certain sorts of software available. What would you say is the best thing to use? Um, well, Zero is what we use, okay? And it does actually hook up to a lot of bank accounts. Yeah, it does have connections with a lot of bank accounts. What I would say, if I'm being very honest, um, is that these bank feeds can drop yeah so i'm a bit reluctant to promote them so you know when i talked to you and i mentioned uh, zero i talked to you about dext and things like that um uh bank feeds are a possibility and we do have clients using them but uh it has uh it's not as robust as i would like it to be okay um yeah Hi. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, with uh, drawdown. Yeah. Uh, for advocates, uh, are you aware of uh, a chambers, uh, or is it, it, does it happen where a uh, drawdown is offered for people who have already completed uh, the advocates? So between finishing the advocates and uh, starting the conclusion, uh, 
uh, are you aware if that's sort of done and, and do you know what the tax implications are? With, with the tax include okay, um, a drawdown has tax implications regardless of whether you're doing your bar course or not, okay, or whether the drawdown is taxable depends entirely, okay, on the structure of your award. Another way of thinking about it that may make it easier, the way to think about your award and how it's taxed, you need to think, what would I have received had I not received the award? Think about it that way. What would I have received in my second six had I not taken the drawdown? And that amount will be taxable. And it's taxable when you prepare your first set of accounts. It is not taxable when you take that drawdown. Okay? It might be that maybe a lot earlier. I have had clients who made that mistake. They've come to me, they've declared that drawdown in a tax turn when they didn't need to. Okay, so watch out for that. Thank you. So that's all we've got time for today, um, guys. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And a huge thank you to Jackie Hi, for taking the time as well. So thank you very much.